When I was a young graduate student, I got to use one of the giant telescopes at the Las Campanas Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile. I was traveling with a much more experienced astronomer from Europe, but it was his first time in the Southern Hemisphere. He went outside for a weather check and came back looking annoyed to report that there were two gigantic clouds in the sky. I went to look and it was the most crystal clear night I'd ever seen. Was my colleague suffering altitude sickness? Then I realized there were two clouds in the sky, two hazy blobs just off the dust streaked center of the Milky Way band. I laughed out loud. This wasn't water vapor, this was lunch. The Milky Way's lunch. Find a dark night in the Southern Hemisphere and you'll see it too. The several billion stars of the large and the small Magellanic clouds in their slow death spiral towards the Milky Way. My colleague needn't have worried. We did some great observing that night. But astronomers watching the resulting collision in around 2 billion years might have more cause for concern. When we scan the heavens with giant telescopes like those at Las Campanas, we see galactic cannibalism everywhere. We see moments that appear frozen on the human timescale but are really snapshots of the incredibly violent process of galaxy formation. This is how all galaxies are made. We can piece together a pretty good understanding of this process from countless snapshots. Looking into the distance means looking into the past. So it's possible to stitch together a Frankenstein flipbook of galaxy evolution. But what about our home galaxy? It would be nice if we could learn the Milky Way's true history and final fate. And in fact, we can. Since that night on Las Campanas, enormous surveys have tracked the positions and motions of more than a billion Milky Way stars. We are now able to calculate a detailed and dynamical map of the Milky Way. We can predict its future mergers with the Magellanic Clouds and Andromeda. But perhaps more astonishing, we can reconstruct its past. But before we get to this, let's review what we know about the Milky Way of the present and of galaxy evolution in the general sense. The Milky Way is a pretty typical barred spiral galaxy. Our Sun is in the disk on a minor outcropping of one of the spiral arms. It orbits the same direction as all the disk stars once every couple hundred million years. In the center, we have the bulge, an elongated spheroid of stars that all orbit randomly at different angles. All of this is surrounded by the halo, which is also spheroidal, but twice the diameter of the 100,000 light year wide disk. This thing is sprinkled with wayward stars and ancient dense mini galaxies called globular clusters. But mostly the halo is made of dark matter, which also suffuses the disk and the bulge and constitutes 80% of the Milky Way's mass. The entire galaxy is beautiful and intricately structured. Weird to think that it built itself into this through a life of violence. So let's look at what we know about galaxy evolution based on all the other galaxies in the universe. We actually talked about this process recently in our episode on the galactic habitable zone. The first galaxies collapsed from very slight overdense regions in the hot hydrogen and helium gas that filled the universe after the Big Bang. It's hard to see the galaxies in the first billion years or so. Galaxies were still growing and most are too small to see at those great distances. The most distant galaxy known as of the filming of this episode was discovered only in April this year. It shines out from a young universe only 250 million years after the Big Bang. Back then, galaxies were raging storms of star formation due to the abundance of gas back then. We only see the brightest of those first galaxies, but based on the flipbook that we've assembled of the following several billion years, we do have a clear picture. Galaxies assemble from the bottom up, which just means that small clumps form first and then merge into larger clumps. So early galaxies were messy and mostly small and formed stars furiously. These clumps fell together and spun each other up into whirling disks, and their violent convulsions settled into the density waves that we see as spiral arms. The new spiral galaxies continued to gobble up wispy, irregular galaxies to grow that disk. So that's how the Milky Way got its current form. But how can we possibly reconstruct the details of such a chaotic process? The stars from every previous merger are now mixed all across the Milky Way disk or through the halo. Teasing out the Milky Way's history is sometimes called 
stellar archaeology. But perhaps galactic forensics is a better description, teasing out the past violent encounters from evidence that in some cases has been carefully buried. Let's review that evidence. Item 1. Stars that join the Milky Way at the same time, like during a merger, should have similar properties. For example, stars that form from the gas of the same galaxy tend to have similar amounts of heavy elements in them, as that gas that formed them was enriched by the same number of supernovae and other explosions. We can measure the heavy element abundance, also called metallicity, by looking at the dips and spikes in a star's spectrum the results from specific elements sucking up or producing light at specific wavelengths. Stars with similar metallicities could have come from the same merger events, or were perhaps produced in the same burst of star formation triggered by that event. Spectra on their own aren't really enough to tell if two stars came from the same galactic snack. So, evidence item number two. If two stars came from the same merger, they should have similar orbits. If their orbital speeds are even slightly different, they may have drifted to opposite sides of the galaxy by now. But there are other orbital properties that we can try to match. For example, how stretched out or eccentric are their orbits? And we can look at the orientation of the orbits relative to the galactic disk. Let's see what our forensic investigation has told us so far. A lot, actually. For example, Astronomers have identified the last truly gigantic merger that happened to the Milky Way around 10 billion years ago. This merger was so large, around 50 billion suns worth of matter, that it must have reshaped the galaxy and can be thought of as the birth of the modern Milky Way. The galaxy that the Milky Way consumed has been dubbed Gaia Enceladus, named for the Gaia Space Telescope, which was used to discover the event, and it did that by identifying stars from this devoured galaxy in the Milky Way's halo. The Enceladus part is for the Greek titan of that name and has nothing to do with the moon of Saturn. Gaia is able to identify the stars from this merger because of the telescope's incredible ability to pinpoint stellar positions. That enables it to detect tiny motions, which in turn allows astronomers to reconstruct detailed orbits of Milky Way stars. The stars from Gaia Enceladus move in highly elongated orbits in the inner halo of the galaxy, but with a slight backwards bend to the orbit, a clear indication that these stars were not born in our galaxy. We've also found a group of 13 globular clusters with matching orbital properties and spectra that were probably once part of Gaia Enceladus. We see more evidence for this past violence in the disk of the Milky Way. That disk has two parts. There's the thin disk, which is a few hundred light years thick and is the main star factory of the Milky Way. It's the home to the spiral arms and the big bright star forming clouds and our sun. We did an episode on why galaxies become flat disk, but the TLDW is that giant gas clouds tend to collapse into thin gas disks and then produce stars that share that geometry. Surrounding the thin disk we have, you guessed it, the thick disk which extends a few thousand light years above and below its more slender counterpart. Not all spiral galaxies have a thick disk, which suggests something special happened to the Milky Way to create it. It's made of stars, not gas, and these stars orbit just a little faster on orbits that are more inclined than the thin disk. That causes them to rise above and below the Milky Way disk, leading to the aforementioned thickness. Those stars are different in other ways. For example, they tend to have fewer heavy elements that suggest they formed before the thin disk stars around 9 billion years ago, plus or minus a billion years. We already have a perfectly consistent explanation for the origin of the thick disk. It may have been formed during the merger with Gaia Enceladus. While the stars of Gaia Enceladus got mixed into the halo, the crazy gravitational pulls of the two galaxies slamming into each other kicked up the orbits of many of the stars in the Milky Way's original thin disk to create the thick disk. Meanwhile, the fresh gas from the merger replenished and reformed the thin disk and triggered a new round of star formation. Since its very large and thickening breakfast 10 billion years ago, the Milky Way has only snacked lightly. But we can trace that history also. When a dwarf galaxy gets too close to the Milky Way, it gets pulled thin 
as tidal forces cause its near side to move faster than its rear. It gets drawn out into a lengthening tidal stream and ultimately can be wrapped around the galaxy even multiple times. In the end, it disperses into the Milky Way's halo. Our galaxy has dozens of known streams. Some of the littlest ones are still close together, so it's easy for astronomers to pick out the little stripe of stars, like GD1, a globular cluster that's in the process of being pulled apart. On the other hand, some of the biggest, like the Helmi stream, contain tens of millions of stars and wrap in a full loop around the Milky Way. Perhaps the biggest of all the snacks the Milky Way has had since its Gaia Enceladus breakfast is the Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy, which first fell in around 5 billion years ago. Since then, it's wrapped all the way around the galaxy, going up and over the poles and coming back down to punch through the disk three times. Most importantly, the massive core is still relatively intact and moving together, so every billion years or so when it punches through the Milky Way disk, its gravity hits like a hammer. Well, actually, more like a drumstick. As the mass of the galaxy approaches, it pulls the disk of the Milky Way up, but when it passes through, it pulls it back down again, like beating a drum or plucking a guitar string. The stars oscillate up and down in the galactic plane, making a very faint ripple through the disk. As best we can tell, the three passes that the core of the Sagittarius Dwarf have made through the disk correspond to three episodes of star formation in the Milky Way, and one of these passes even happens to line up with the formation of our Sun and Solar System four and a half billion years ago. Now, we're not saying that the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is fully responsible for the existence of our Solar System, but we're not saying it's not. It's certainly highly plausible. Altogether, we know of up to seven mergers in the history of the galaxy and at least 42 distinct streams surrounding the Milky Way. And as we continue to study the data from the Gaia mission, we're likely to find more. This finally brings us to the present as the Milky Way prepares to eat its lunch and second biggest meal yet. The Milky Way's two brighter satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic clouds, are currently making their first pass. Already we see them being pulled apart, the Magellanic clouds of massive tails that make a great loop all across the bottom half of the galaxy, a 600,000 light year long tail of gas called the Magellanic Stream. And while the Magellanic clouds themselves are only about 1% of the mass of the Milky Way themselves, the entire stream may be 10 billion solar masses due to the enormous amount of dark matter it contains, making it easily the biggest meal that the Milky Way has had since Gaia Enceladus. When that merger happens, the Milky Way will get a fresh infusion of gas, probably triggering another bout of star formation in around 2 billion years. The accompanying supernova waves may not be the best thing for life on Earth, but we do have 2 billion years to get ready for that. All of the Milky Way's past mergers have been minor, meaning that the Milky Way was always significantly more massive than its meal. That's going to change with the final merger of our local group of galaxies, when Andromeda and the Milky Way collide. This is a major merger, because Andromeda is a full-blown spiral galaxy in its own right. In fact, it's around twice as massive as the Milky Way. We've gone into the gory detail of this collision in a previous episode. Go ahead and watch that one if you want to see our galaxy get a taste of its own medicine. But for now, Let's enjoy these short few billion years of being the biggest and hungriest kid on the playground as we gobble up any galaxies foolish enough to stray into the Milky Way's little patch of space-time. Hey everyone, before we get to comments, I wanted to let you know about search.pbsspacetime.com. This incredible tool allows you to search the entire space-time catalog for any word or phrase and get links to the exact time codes where I mention those words. It's an incredible resource built entirely by one of our fans, Vagard Nosum. Vagard, we at Spacetime can't thank you enough for the creativity and ingenuity of your work. There's a link in the description so you can start exploring search.pbsspacetime.com right away. Today, we're doing comment responses for the last two episodes. The one on the galactic habitable zone and its implications for the Fermi paradox, and the one where we showed why space is not expanding inside gravitationally bound systems like the Milky Way. Let's start with the galactic habitable zone. In that episode, 
I said that parts of the galaxy with too much heavy element abundance might not produce life because those systems would produce too many gas giants. Some of you asked why that's the case. It's simply because gas giants form when a large enough rocky or icy core forms to start holding on to hydrogen and helium atmospheres. That needs to happen before the star itself turns on and blasts away all of the lighter gases. A few of you pointed out that even a system with lots of gas giants could have habitable moons. Now, that's true, but there's a good reason to restrict ourselves to Earth-like systems when we do these calculations of the abundance of life-bearing worlds. It's because we're trying to find the most conservative number for possible origins of life to help explain the Fermi paradox. We want to find out even if the most conservative estimate still gives us a large number, because that tells us that we need to do work to look for other things to explain the absence of evidence for technological life. Some of you pointed out other possible explanations for the Fermi paradox and the specialness of Earth. Lucas Nicholson and others remind us that the Earth's moon is exceptionally large, and such large moons are probably very rare, even if Earth mass planets are common. Our large moon has been proposed as an important factor in the appearance of life, which may have first appeared in tidal pools. The tidal pool hypothesis is no longer the clear front runner for abiogenesis. For example, geothermal vents on the ocean floor are looking like a good option for the origin of life, and they don't care about the moon. These are also found on gas giant moons, so that boosts our potential abiogenesis location number quite a bit. John Thatcher told us about another idea that I hadn't heard of, that the late heavy bombardment may have been needed to seed the surface of the planet with a high abundance of heavy elements, which was perhaps necessary to get life started. The late heavy bombardment was a massive meteor shower that lasted millions of years and probably isn't something experienced by most terrestrial planets. On the other hand, some scientists doubt that the late heavy bombardment even happened. All of the evidence is from cratering on the moon and biases in the analysis of that data may have led to miscalculations of the bombardment rate. Okay, on to the expanding universe stuff. Snufkin Matt asks, if space doesn't expand inside a gravitational field, then what happens at the boundary between this where the space is expanding? Would the expanding space try to drag neighboring space with it and would you get a kind of tug of war between the two? Well, yes and no. First, assuming no cosmological constant and dark energy, the expansion of the universe does not continue to tug on the space within gravitationally bound regions. However, those bound regions fell together from matter that was initially moving apart in the expanding universe, and that kinetic energy affects the final form of the bound system. So I would think galaxies that formed in an expanding universe would be more puffed up than those that formed in a static universe. Nathaniel Cleland responded to that comment to address the dark energy issue. He rightly points out that the Schwarzschild metric isn't really valid in a universe with a cosmological constant. There would indeed be an initial effect due to the tiny vacuum energy inside the galaxy. However, that effect is minuscule and couldn't really be characterized as a tug of war. It would result in a very, very slightly larger size to the Milky Way than without dark energy. Eric Marsh asks if space inside gravitationally bound systems actually contracts rather than simply not expanding with the rest of the universe. Well, the answer is kind of yes. You can interpret the math that way. There is a valid interpretation of general relativity in which we can say that space is flowing inward in a gravitational field. You may have heard me say that space flows across the event horizon of a black hole at the speed of light. That's the velocity of an inertial frame that falls from infinite distance towards the black hole. In the same way, an inertial frame at the cosmological event horizon is flowing away from us at the speed of light. Evelyn always tells people not to imagine intergalactic space as expanding, but rather that galaxies are shrinking. Jonathan Rose has a similar hypothesis that all matter is constantly shrinking within a static space. Listen guys, I understand that as smart, science-educated people, it's extremely tempting to make up almost plausible nonsense to fool the common folk. Believe me, I feel the temptation as powerfully as anyone. 
but neurological studies have shown that people who accept or propagate science misinformation are 50% more likely to suffer from degenerative microcephaly in later years. In other words, everyone's brain shrinks like those galaxies. I think I can feel it happening to me right now.